Okay, starting, so I'm recording here for Tuesday, April 16. Uh, let's pull up the meeting agenda here. Tuesday, April 16. Okay, um, let me share my screen here too. And I'll start, so you guys can hear me? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, great. Great, so uh, uh, here we go. So for today's meeting, uh, one thing I want to report, so I'm working on the the production engineering for 3D printers, um, specifically a very high value distributed production methods, so cassette being a bulk printer per day being built, and how do we do that in an extremely radically uh, efficient manner such that many people can pick up, and also while we're developing pretty high-end printers and, and getting the quality control up, up and going. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about now the quiet. Uh, one thing I've been looking at is the quiet stepper drivers, um, which could be a great upgrade. And <clears throat> I'll go more into the top printer production engineering just to uh, cover where I'm at here. Uh, and right now I've got pretty good sound here, pretty good good uh, internet. So we've got the fiber line here finally, after years and years, after a decade or so. But yeah, that's all good. So I'll start with um, well, I'm gonna go go to my log uh, mj and click on a few links uh, so i did look at into detail about the, the the new stepper driver little tips that are out there uh, and the, the reasons are a couple so it's on a page called tmc 2130 on the wiki so you, we still got ram standard controller with this little pluggable stepper drivers but the news here isn't and i was trying to shake this out there's a recent i mean relatively recent kind of a thing which is from back in 2016 already um, uh, a type of little stepper driver that that is one completely silent so if you've ever run a 3d printer they're noisy they're quite a, quite noisy as the step motors go and run but this one is completely silent and the other thing is about it is that you can end up doing sensorless homing uh, using the TMC 2130 stepper driver. So you can take a look at all that. Now, in order to use the, so, so okay, can we do that? How simple is it actually to implement it? The advantage being get rid of your two end stops and not only two end stops, if I was just reading about this, you can probably do the Z end stop as well, which is now the probe. So instead of um, using probe and end stops, basically the when motor moves, it detects a bump. Like if, if you bump into something, that means the current is going to go slightly up in the stepper driver, and that's detected. And Marvin has actually set up that already. The the firmware is already can handle that. Uh, so you can get rid of your probes, uh, the probe and two end stops. That's major major stuff. That's great. Now. The only trouble with that is it's a little, at this point, it's a little complicated. There's a bunch of, not too complicated, I mean, you, you'd have to do a bunch of rewiring, as in connecting the new stepper drivers with pins that are facing up into some of these other pins on the ramps board. And there's also another issue about having to solder, because this terminal here, if you see my cursor, um, that's currently taken up by the SD card reader and the LCD screen that we have right now. So you'd have to solder over the top of that. So just a few little inconveniences, including a bunch of rework of the code in terms of um, a bunch of settings that have to be reworked throughout in the code. So not absolutely transparent, but uh, quite doable. Now, there's bad news though. There's, uh, that's TMC2130, 
Now, just recently, like, I think in the last year or so, it, the new one came out, which is the TMC2208, which, uh, after somewhat being disappointed by the TMC2130 in terms of th thorough rework of the software, the, of the firmware, and uh, all this rewiring stuff, um, I read further, and TMC2208 actually allows you a complete drop and replacement. So it's a newer one. Um, now the only thing is, it will not allow you the sensors homing. It will get you the complete silent operation. That's a good part. Um, as far as if you want to, you know, right now, I could be in this meeting and running my printer next to me, and it could just run in the background without making any noise. That's That's really good if you have say your home office filled with three printers that otherwise would be, I mean, kind of would have to have earmuffs, <laughs> earplugs, uh, or I mean, if, you, if you're not sensitive, that's fine, but I mean, just make all the noise. So, so one, the sound operating is awesome. So right now that it turns out without making any changes, the TMC2208, you don't have to rewire them anyway or change the firmware. They run as is to, to get you the super silent mode. Uh, another advantage being because it, it, it actually gets to higher set micro-stepping, like right now we run at 16 micro-stepping. Um, it's still bumpy. This, the DMCs have 256 micro-stepping, that means the motion is super smooth, it's absolutely smooth. So there's reports that print quality actually goes up because you get less, less kind of these inertial effects of the stepper motor going through its steps. Uh, for its cost, even though it looks like pretty smooth when you look at it, there's really like very tiny bumps in emotion as the separate mode moves. So that's really good stuff. Uh, we'll do right now here then. Uh, I'll go to the uh, duplicate here. I'll go to the uh, 3D printer critical path. So what does that mean for what I like to do? I'll go to the critical path. I'm, I'm Kind of laying out what are the absolute priorities in terms of okay the next steps of development. So as we do the release of the next and improved version of printer. So first of all, I've got the uh, as I mentioned last week doing 3D print corners, so you don't have to weld the frame. Um, right now, I'm also t testing this. Um, it's actually a clone of the Titan Arrow, but it's got a hardened geared extruder which is good so that the extruder gear never like really never wears out like if you use abrasive filaments it would wear out after some time uh, not, a, not a big deal but something to look at um another thing is that we're still not set up for like like the the new printer gets complete eight by eight inch and i just have to reset that a little bit in the, the code in the 12 inch uh frame printer we're able to get well, for the 12-inch frame, which is convenient and that it's shippable in a UPS flat rate box, which is 12 inches, um, the 8-inch that we can get the full 8x8 eight eight using the current geometry that we print out of a 12-inch frame. So uh, just put that into the code. Uh, I was going to clean up the wire box, as I mentioned before. Uh, there's a little detail about optimizing how we print the NSAP holders that you don't have to clean it up. And I want to do this thing here, the 0.8 millimeter nozzle production engineering. So technically we've been printing the parts at 0.4 millimeter nozzles. But cool thing about 0.8, which is what I, the last one I built with the Volcano nozzle, uh, that gets you four times the print speed. Because the print speed is going to be the square of the nozzle radius, or square of the nozzle diameter. So going from 0.4 millimeter to 0.8 millimeter actually quadrupling the speed of printing so that's attractive if you print an out a lot yes um yeah there's a side detail on the cable chain and that the first piece in the current version which is v 1902 that is just a little misaligned so i just just one fix on the cable chain piece uh, small detail um, I also want to 3D print the control panels. Right now we're cutting out the control panel out of plexiglass. Well, no reason why we can't print it out. Perfect view for 3D printing, so we get rid of one additional part. Uh, the control panel where you have all the electronics, that might as well be 3D printed. Perfect. So you can print out all the holes, so we have to do all the drilling for mounting the components. So that's a real time saver from the production engineering standpoint. 
uh, 3D printer control panel out of PLA or ABS or whatever. Uh, right now we're using able, the little zip ties to attach all the components, to like the power supply and everything else. Uh, and then we got to update the CAD on the overall printer. Now where is the TMC2208? That's actually right here too. Uh, so that's immediate priority. TMC2208 drop in placement, no code changes. There may be one thing for the TMC2208 where we need to uh, just reverse one wire, the wire. Uh, wire connecting the step where there might be a pin reversal needs to happen. That's a physical thing to do. A uh, very minor detail, otherwise use everything as is. Using, right now we're still backwards in Marlin, like we're on like Marlin 1.0. Latest that the, um, all the sensorless homing stuff is that's in Marlin 1.9 and higher. So that's why uh, TMD228 doesn't require the higher higher marlin can use use existing marlin uh, but eventually when i switch over it's just to do all the firmware it's not that not such a big deal uh, just updating code so we can take the full power take advantage of the full power of the sensors holding the quiet operation uh, uh, complete control of the the stepper current through software it's no longer to get a turn it little knob on a separate drive we actually do that through the code through the firmware so that's uh, basically the new stepper drives are very configurable um, for complete quiet operation and sensorless and detecting when they hit something and also the thing like when you uh, lose power they can actually they have the capacity to return to proper printing because they can remember where they lost power so that's a feature that's not in Marin yet but Prusa printers do have that in their system uh, Prusa is going to lead me away in their custom Marlin, their own firmware development, which is based on Marlin, but that hasn't migrated to Marlin yet, as far as like when you lose power and be able to completely restart a print, because uh, the software is set up for power loss uh, instances. So there's the 8 inch 12, uh, 8 inch red 12 inch frame, and as I was talking last week, um, in order to use 100% of the material from a cut out a metal sheet of 1 8 inch steel, which is currently what we use for the printer. Uh, the, the last smaller size, a 10, 10 inch frame, which can handle a 6 inch bed. And we can actually do the, the micro version of a 4 or 5 inch bed using the innermost cutout, which is 8 inches. So if we don't want to throw that out, we can still do about a 4 or 5 inch bed micro printer. What there is, uh, that's not a crazy thing. There's uh, plenty of printers that are tiny, like the micro size printers, which have uh, four or five inch beds. So that still makes sense, and that you can do plenty of parts that are four inch. I mean, four inch is still sizable for uh, if you say want to print fittings or various other components. Uh, so that's kind of where it is in the, the roadmap. Um, let's see. So on the 12th. Well, we're in the production engineering, just continuing on that and, and focusing on getting that, including the, the quiet drivers. So one major improvement is going to be that uh, the next iteration with the TMC 2208 is going to be completely silent. And after that, we can worry about the the sensorless homing operation. It's going to be a little bit more of shade down with the whole system because you have to fine-tune all the current settings and everything else. Like when you bump, how do you know that you bump? What exactly what threshold do you set within the software for understanding that that's a bump, not just a regular motion with the printer? So, so there's fine-tuning, a lot of fine-tuning there. Just probably take a month or two of work. Um, but in an immediate sense, as we get ready for, uh, say, the summer school in July, uh, we just do the quiet. 3D printer, quiet stepper drive operation. So that's kind of where I'm at on my side. And yeah, maybe um, let's move on to other people. I think that's kind of some of the main points. Let's see if I look at um, if I look at my log. Um, Did I cover everything I wanted to to do? Yeah, now just you know one more comment on 
um, yeah, the boot camp for 2019, the summer school. Uh, so, as I said last time, focus will be so so really just mastering the reprinting infrastructure, including the ability to make filament and doing a large printer. So right now, if we go to bootcamp 2019, the current proposed schedule is uh, so that's uh, 2019 schedule. So we do the 3D per build as normal. Day two, we'll just focus on making design files and pre cuts so we can everyone that's walks out being confident they can actually produce basic designs in pre uh, Then we do the filament maker infrastructure on day three. Uh, and, the, and, and if we have the filament maker, we can start making plastic. Then we're ready to print very large things. So day four, looking at building the large 3D printer. So basically one meter head, where the z-axis, there's four z-axis, and the xy entry is moving on top of those for Z axes. And why that kind of strategy that's different than what we have now right now the XY gantry is fixed up top and the bed moves up and down. Well with a one meter bed, just the weight of that is like I don't know like uh, it's an eighth inch steel that's reinforced, but it ends up weighing quite a bit. It's I think it's like fifty pounds or so, fifty or six pounds it's without a print. Now, if you talk about doing big prints on that, they're going to add twice or three or four up to uh, a full, full print on, on a meter bed. If you filled up the whole bed, like if you did like one solid cube, that's, I think, um, it's about 400 kilos. If, if, uh, it it's kinda adds up, but yeah, like a couple of people's weight. If you do a full 3D printer, print on a one meter bed it really gets heavy so we will fix the bed at the bottom and move the gantry up and down in this if we do large mini printer so that would definitely be the thing to do otherwise we have to go to like, like either like super high gear down or much better step promoters and things like that so if we keep it the more simple with more measurable parts fix the bed at the bottom so you don't have to lift that high structure just lift the gantry um, Okay, so to wrap up the schedule on the um, on, um, summer school here, so day five, um, I think it would be a nice idea, and this is kind of like shaking the schedule down here, but I think using the polycast with 3D printing filament where you can do lost, lost plastic 3D printing, which you then fill with metal, uh, so lost, yeah, lost, it's, I think it's a form of PLA. It's a lost plastic metal casting. I think that's that would be really to get right into not only plastic parts but metal parts that are as precise as the three prints. And that's that's very much accessible technology using a um, 3D printing film and that dedicated for that kind of work, which burned out completely. So you don't even have to like burn it out. You just pour the metal in, and the plat and the plastic get burnt out of your form, like out of plaster Paris. So it's an accessible way to get. Uh, for example, zinc aluminum, which is 60,000 psi. Uh, no, not 60. It's uh, it's 49, 49,000 psi, about 50,000 psi, and that's that's as strong as mild steel. So here we get access to very strong parts uh, from 3D printing. And then uh, day six and seven, I was, was going to focus on just just using all the techniques we learned and so for 3D printing and the potential work with metal to I to do a little bit of work on the cordless drill or other projects I would like to build. I mean, if you have uh, a number of printers running at that time, we have the option to build uh, other CNC machines like CNC router, even a heavy duty CNC machine if people are willing to do that. I, can, I think I will open that to to the, the crowd to see what, what you want to do. But I'd like to, I'd like to see some work done on a cordless drill, which is a very exciting project that's really lends itself well to 3D printing, including the possibility of metal parts. And then some of the larger CNC machines based on the universal axis, and we'll kind of have that as an open field day, a couple of days where we're experimenting, actually getting to a real something where all of us decide we're not going to just spread all into just a whole bunch of random products. We'll decide to, to work on, okay, let's, let's get this thing done in the next couple of days using all the prototyping capacity, like 10 or 20 3D printers. So um, that will be pretty good. I think that's it for me for what I've done so far. Uh, so let's move on to the others. Who wants to go next?
Well, I'm here anyway. Tell Fatty to repeat them. We've been working on a rugged map. Okay, so since uh, people in our crew here haven't heard about it, can you, can you briefly describe the concept that you're trying to do? Okay, yeah, I have to actually. Uh, this is making a plastic, or sorry, making a mold out of uh, a material called calcium aluminate cement and plastic paris. Mm -hmm. uh, you dissolve the plastic paris away and then you have just a calcium aluminate cement. So it's going to be a high precise mold because we can. We're actually milling mold in layers, like, um, kind of hard to explain. But, uh, I actually have a video, but... Can you point us to a video, or uh, your own video, or someone's doing this? Um, I have own video. Um, this has been, uh, this is a process that's been in development since 1992, actually. Um, uh, yeah, there's different groups have called it shape deposition modeling, some groups have called it accident injection sculpture. Um, but basically you're doing, you're putting the tire layer down once as a sort of thin rectangular block and you subject it to a milling operation. Uh, and you do that repeatedly to build up layers of, uh, calcium aluminate cement in this case, which are milled. So, uh, it's highly accurate mold. And so mm -hmm. once you got your highly accurate mold, you can then fill that with, um, I was hoping to first try thermal, uh, thermal set. On your things because they can copy the mold almost exactly, and if you fill them with carbon fiber, you can get materials as strong as aluminum. So, mm -hmm. that's pretty good stuff. And they're not very really expensive. They're like, uh, I think it was like $15 a kilogram or something. Mm -hmm. So, the idea is to make super precise molds that are milled from calcium aluminate cements, and then you pour metal or whatever. Uh, thing that you're going to set into that. Yeah, one well, of the strengths is that you can pour all kinds of stuff into that mold. Because you can use plastic, metal, different, you're going to get different accuracies depending on the material. But you could use even the rubber and foam, for instance. Mm -hmm. So it is. works with aluminum? Yeah, it's work with aluminum. Aluminum, aluminum, aluminum calcium, aluminate cement, uh, like plastic paris, but they're going to blow up high temperatures. Temperatures involved with steel casting. Can you go up steel casting with calcium aluminum? Aluminate cement? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And they're used for that purpose in the process called lock casting. Where, uh, lock casting? It's, it's basically what you're talking about with the lost play. Mm -hmm. um, you just take a wax model or a plastic model and you put it in like a Tupperware container. And then you fill the container with a calcium aluminate cement. And then you burn out the plastic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is that... A stand, like, so there's green sand as a way to, to do passing. Uh, do people use calcium luminate just like green sand, or is this, like, not popular? Because I never really... I, I hear a lot about Obviously. green sand. Well, I guess I've read up on the block molding process, and the main reason it's not used is that it's more expensive than green sand, because mm -hmm. with the green sand, you can recycle sand. Yeah. Um, but the calcium luminate cement is like, it's like, uh, just like Portland cement, it's real cheap stuff, it's like, Bellows with a 50 pound bag or something. So, if you're making a ton of parts, maybe that's not economical or something, but I don't think it's a major barrier. Mm -hmm. It is used by hobbyists. But, like, uh, casting steel is not that common anyway. I think the bottom line is that most people don't really care about high accuracy with casting because they're going to machine it anyway. It's like the with one accuracy. Mm -hmm. Is the idea here that you machine it beforehand to get super accuracy? Well, the mold is going to be highly accurate. That's so. That's great strength. If you're going to follow with thermoplastic uh, molding, for instance, which copies the mold very accurately. But if you're going to do steel casting, um, I think it's still a, a huge strength because I've read that premium uh, casting of steel can actually get pretty accuracy, like uh, the range of 50 microns over. Uh, I think it was 10 centimeters, mm -hmm. which is pretty good. Well, it was 80 microns over 10 centimeters. Um, which is still pretty good, and uh, with really good surface finishes too, like matte, nice surface finish. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but it depends. The accuracy you're going to get out of it, it depends on that casting process. Yeah. So, for example, I'm looking at this castable. Is that what they call? Can you see my screens? That, for example, yeah. good, good um, I can see there's an enormous variety of different refractory materials. Uh, most of them will actually degrade slightly at steel casting temperatures. 
And that's considered like just a uh, run in the middle. Okay, since mm -hmm. Cosmos is off of Portland Cement, that's not going to stand the temperature still casting very effectively. It does work to sound a little bit, like a little bit of cracking and stuff, which is good for the surface finish, and yeah, it's not perfect. Like, it's probably good if you don't care about accuracy that much, again, it's like, same deal. But, uh... Calcium, yeah, somehow, where could I find it? Dropping. So, what comes up is these tubs. That's a good it's question. I might have to... Right. I don't know where exactly you buy it. It would have to be on... Yeah. The best place to get it. Or uh, AliExpress or Alibaba. Like those, that's direct business to business sites. And they'll sell the pure stuff. But it's always a problem for me, like, whenever I want something that's like pure stuff or like, you know, good stuff. It's not going to be on Amazon or yeah. Google Shopping. And when... Is that what we need? It says this one, for example, has 85% alumina. Is that... Is alumina what we're looking for? Uh... Calcium aluminate cement is both calcium oxide and alumina in a crystalline structure where they, uh, like, molecules are intertwined. Like, uh... So, I don't know, like, they have all these non men these uh, terms, they kind of mix them up a lot when it comes to refractory materials. But a lot of them are actually kind of interchangeable. But I would just get the pure calcium aluminate cement on AliExpress or Alibaba. AliExpress is not the view of it, because uh, calcium yeah. aluminate cement, Alibaba, AliExpress, or Alibaba. I've looked for a bunch of those uh, aluminates mixtures for refractory cement for things like pocket stoves and it is really confusing what exactly the chemistries are because uh, different types of bricks and those materials have, have different uh, chemistries and they vary mm -hmm. apparently quite a bit you know, for temperature and uh, hardness and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. No, if you go to... It's hard to source them in small quantities. Yeah. Yeah, well, they do have it in, and they have it like, you know, like 300 bucks a ton. So yeah, it's probably like that, and you probably end up like 500 bucks in shipping or something like that. Um, but still, if you, you know, if you're going to actually get into it, it's very affordable. If you, They'll send you a sample, usually. If you want a smaller amount, you said, can you send me like 10 kilograms as a sample? Because I want to do some testing, see if it works for what I need. They'll still charge it, but yeah. Yeah. For the workshop. Did you try that? Have you tried it? Oh, no, I haven't tried it yet. I haven't gotten that far. I've been doing the, pro the process of producing the decode for the CNC code to run. The CNC machine to run is it's as far as I'm able to get because I don't have a workspace or anything. I'm working in Matt's garage right now. So, but, yeah, it's not practical. Do much more. Are you but, yeah, I'm not. Are you uh, documenting that what you're working on somewhere? Um, there is, yeah, there's a page, a Sensorica page. I don't know if you heard of Sensorica. Yeah. It's a little in Montreal. Yeah, um, so if you go to the Sensorica Projects site, um, it's kind of buried on the website. On this, it's not a very good website. But they have a section for projects, and uh, on there, we have some documentation. I have my own section there. Oh, it's not calcium aluminum, it's, uh, it would be under, uh, there it is, yeah, that's it. I posted an update recently, like a week ago or something. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so that's my home base there. I mean, uh, so you call that... Mold. Yeah. Mold casting. Mold casting. Yeah. So yeah, that's what that project. Uh, I feel strongly about it, but I really haven't been able to make project progress. Uh, I've tried again and again to get a workspace. There's a place in Montreal that I applied to and went to hoops and stuff. And then in the end, they said, oh, I have a workshop and really for a while, but it was too small. Uh, and I have a uh, little workshop in my place, it's not going to last long. Uh, 
but today hopefully I'll rent a house with a garage and I can work in there. That's gonna be a long time. Yeah, I can just post it on the wiki mold casting. Um, oh, the thing that's really attractive for you just to get it is that are you talking about the precision of the molds? Is that you can get literally finished parts? Is that what you're after? Certainly finished plastic parts. Like with the stone that polyurethane, I think we we can get parts that are like store bought injection molded parts. Like we're talking mirror polish, highly accurate. Uh, yeah. Because those molds that injection molded parts are made from are milled. They're made yeah. through milling. So right. we're not gonna get using that. Uh, maybe even a little bit better. Because there's no shrinkage and stuff when you do the polyurethane. Yeah. So yeah, I'm almost about it. Because yeah. it's just like when you need something to seal against fluid, or you need gears that don't make any noise and last a long time, or you need all kinds of stuff like that. Like you gotta have accuracy and you gotta have it smooth surfaces, right? Like three D printing is great for a lot of stuff, but you can't really get those last couple microns now. Typically, in any kind of a casting process, there's there's post finishing with, with machining, right? Or grinding. Well, that's what I mean. If you use the polyurethane. Um, like, like I say, it's going to be like injection molded part. The injection molded parts aren't usually finished much. That's fine. I don't think they finish at all usually. Yeah. Um, especially like a gear. I don't know how you get in there to finish anything. Yeah. So it's, it's going to be the same deal. It's going to be like uh, good, accurate parts. That's for plastic. Now, when it comes to aluminum or steel, like you say, the conventional approaches do. Just cast approximately what you want and then machine it to final dimensions. And uh, I'm not sure how well we're going to be able to do there. But it's certainly true that if you search like premium injection molding or pre premium investment casting, you can find some companies that are advertising parts that are accurate enough they don't need post machine. They call it next shade casting. Sometimes there's a couple different terms. It's not very common, but it's a thing. Yeah, I could post about that on the Sark website. It'd be good to put some background and stuff in there like that. So I get a lot. Of this uh, is common. Like the skepticism that you can get decent accuracy out of casting is pretty common, and uh, it's true that there's a lot of complications, right? Some of them mastered still is the worst. You got all these things transitions. Uh, changes You're molding your cast. Um, saying that I, I mean, are the casts reusable? The cast material is highly reusable. But the cast itself has to be just straight so that you can get the right out of it. Right. You're just uh, going to be, we're just going to submerse in one of those ultrasonic uh, baths that they use for cleaning dishes and stuff, and just uh, subject it to all sound to disintegrate the material. Right. That's the but I, mean, I think that hard sell for me is if you're going to be machining something in the first place already, I mean, you might as well be machining it out of metal. Well, the thing, okay, so, cases, um, unless you have cases where you can't machine it because it's not machinable because of a complex geometry, right? Yeah, that's one of the major reasons. Yeah. That's, yeah. But also, I was, uh, I was, did have the privilege of being into CNC machine for a year, a whole year. I repaired and worked on CNC machines and used them. Yeah. And it gets expensive very fast. Yeah, yeah, uh, no, it's not, not cheap. Yeah. Yeah, so like when you more of a card print especially, you're removing a lot of material and you're cutting it away with it. It's like solid yeah. steel. And so this is going to avoid that. We're yeah, just doing very yeah. yeah. That's good. And I mean, the immediate hit at this is just using this, the same material for I mean, a lot of the similar processes, even without machining it. Even if you just want, you know, some millimeter precision as in three, as in three printing. That's still very useful for casting in general. I mean, so yeah. I mean, the I hope so. are It's like a couple of things really glide there. It's like it's got like four or five different little properties that really make it useful. It will be useful. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's good. Um, are you aiming to do a prototype of that sometime? Like the, yeah, I'd love to do it as soon as possible. I had money budgeted for it and stuff. I was going to buy a mill for 4000 bucks, and uh, actually do it. But it's a big problem to get a workplace. Um, I don't see it. I don't know when I'm going to be able to do it. Yep. 
meantime, we can continue working on the software a little bit. It's mm -hmm. at the point where we can write a plugin for Fusion, and then it can really make the code pretty easily. Yeah. Yeah. That's an important milestone. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty good. Um, okay. And that actually makes me think of one, one more thing about, like, if we go to, like, when we hire to work, and how do we ever do that, you know, on a resource limited scenario? So with stepper motors, I, I ran into this, this uh, really cool thing where, uh, let me just put up a link to that. Um, well, the idea of we actually make our own stepper motors. Yes. Yeah, okay. So, uh, our own stepper motors. So here's how you get there. Uh, there's a, have you seen that on the key? No. Okay. So, I have seen that 3D printed uh, cords. So, take a look uh, at this. Um, this one guy, Dave Hardcop, uh, is doing the following. So I communicated with him on email, he responded immediately, but he did this to split ring. Uh, it's one of these things I never heard of, and I couldn't believe it. Like, but this little stepper motor is actually worse. And inside the casing, it's, it's called a split ring planetary gear. And he's got this little motor part in the back. It's all DIY here. But this thing here had like 500 steps per revolution. It's like, whoa, how do you do that? Well, the secret is this. It's called a slit ring gear. And you have to, uh, you can run a wiki under 3D printed stepper motor. But the idea is that you have a, a planetary gear where <clears throat> in two halves, one half is essentially like one tooth or a couple of teeth different than the other half. And what happens is when, when you move the one part around one time, the other part moves around only like one or two teeth. In other words, you get this huge, huge gear down from this kind of system. So I was actually very impressed and I was looking at, uh, we should try to build this during the the summer camp or, you know, perhaps because it's absolutely spectacular since it's got the same form factor as the NEMA 17. It's got the simple electromagnet mechanism in the back and it gets this amazing gear down. So this to me is um, is getting towards high practicality. And well, but can't you make a real step motor without the planet gearing? Like the one of the great values of step motor is that you get reasonably good torque without gears, never no backlash. Well, except this is going to have like a hundred times more torque if you need it. Uh, if the plastic can hold it to the advantages, this is much more geared down. In other words, for the same amount of torque, think about, uh, they do make separate motors that have like three, five, maybe ten planetary gear downs or other types of gear downs in them. Here you're talking like a hundred or two hundred. But what this means is that a motor like this is sufficient for a precious plastic grind grinder. Now it will go for us very, very slowly, but the torque would be there. And yeah, the plastic wouldn't hold that kind of torque, but if you enlarge the pieces, yes, it absolutely can. So this offers just amazing. Well, the point is, it's all 3D printed. It's, it's the 3D printed gears and pretty simple electromagnet. So the communication from his name is Dave Hardcop. Uh, he said that uh, the electromagnets overheat, so you gotta insulate them uh, so they don't melt your plastic. But yeah, so there's definitely development work, but. I just found this, uh, just the very concept of the splitting planetary gear. If you Google that, try to, uh, I've just found it super fascinating that from this, this tiny, tiny form factor, you're actually getting this hundred or more type of gear down. Because uh, I think I mentioned something before about sacking planetary gears. Well, you can certainly do that with many more parts, but here you don't have to. So just a heads up on a very useful mechanism here. So, anyway, um, I'll leave it at that, so I'll do the 3D printer. 3D printer some more. It's definitely worth trying because, you know, a step motor, it's like, yeah, of course you can make, you set up a regular step motor, but that's, you know, that's a whole bunch of complexity there. That's kind of yeah. beyond the scope. This, this is surprisingly similar. I mean, you've seen the diagrams of them. It's just like, yeah. the electromagnetic stuff doesn't look pretty good too. Yeah, yeah, I mean, conceptually, yes, but they do have these fine teeth on the magnet parts, uh, the metal parts in there that allow for that very fine stepping. 
there's a very fine structure in there so if you at that level you're talking about okay you need to machine that precisely out of whatever metal aluminum or whatever steel now uh, whatever structure there so yeah there's basically it's this this route here that i shoved with this ring planetary gear is just a total cheat because you don't have to go to that the same kind of complexity it's a completely different mechanism instead of using fine resolution you're using the gear down for the resolution and, and the sure. storm factor you don't want to use that in your printer the first is like you'd have a lot of slop in that depends yeah. it may not may not work for a 3d printer as far as that but if you it's just a matter of how accurate your 3d printed parts are because if the the thing you'll be struggling with is backlash no doubt but backlash can be measured accurately and corrected for two uh, like for example already in Merlin you have so-called backlash correction on the stepper motor the for the extruder where because the plastic melts an extruder you have to push forward a little more before it actually starts extruding and it's, it's like a backlash effect but those kinds of effects can be corrected for pretty, pretty specifically and support yourself Okay, so let's keep moving here. Um, let's keep going. Let's see, Abe, do you have do you have an update? Yeah, I I didn't uh, get much pad this uh, week. I'm busy with spring stuff thrown up, but I have a few ideas that's going to hear. But the the printer stuff, I'm, I'm I at least been building a, uh, a shelf actually for to put a 3D printer on here because I don't have a lot of space for that kind of stuff so uh kind of prioritize that this week and um uh i'm getting pretty close to hopefully to getting something finished on that mm -hmm. and then i'll be able to have at least some space for a printer and i can start working more on uh, figuring out what sort of uh printer stuff to get but um <clears throat> yeah i'm kind of thinking about what kind of stuff i mentioned to print um the things i was one or not in some examples of it's uh, these containers for for floating trees they're small you know saplings that grow trees apparently on uh, water apparently that's popular because it on ponds and things that keep them away from predators kind of thinking about that um i've seen examples of the recycling some plastic and foam to float plant trees i like that on ponds or tanks and things and uh experimented with that here, but uh, it'd be nice to do use PLA, but you know the cost and and so on. Uh, probably with PLA printing a lot of material is probably pretty costly compared to other solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. But looking forward to uh, trying some of that stuff. See what uh, is reasonable. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. That sounds cool. Um, let's see. Uh, how about Eric? Yeah, so just a solid update. <clears throat> so um, I uh, had the uh, nozzle assembly piece printed um, at the public library and at the MSU library. Um, as kind of a comparison, um, this was a follow-up kind of experiment um, for Based on the conversations I had with people at the expo, it um, seems like a lot of people are interested in printers, but they don't necessarily need to get their own up and running. So um, the public library is very cheap. Um, the university library gave a, you know, kind of a better print, um, but it was five times more expensive, $10 versus $2. So I'm going to send those results out to the people and, um, you know, show them. It's pretty, pretty easy if they actually want to get into it. Yeah, yeah. Any, um, are you trying to see if there's people interested in the workshop of actually building printers, or? Uh, so I'm going to send an email with, uh, you know, kind of several different options um, to get involved. Um, you know, from just uh, sitting jobs to the libraries um, to, like, you know, trying to build your own D3D and see, um, if there's much of a response and um, people wanting to attend a workshop. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. But I want to kind of offer them information to start with yeah. before I try to 
<laughs> by going into something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that sounds good. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, anything else from anyone? Or so we can wrap up here a little early today. Yeah, so I'll be continuing working on, um, on a production engineering here on a 3D printer and ready for the, the summer summer program here. We we'll focus on getting back and getting to large grants, getting to our own film making. So, so the ad is just a bunch of um, production that we can be doing and just getting the machines in shape to be able to go to the level where you're making your plastic and, and therefore that whole process is inexpensive not to mention that we're getting into the clothing material cycles using 3D printing and <clears throat> hopefully getting into some more of the metal, metal work that results from 3D printing and the casting processes. So this is Can I ask you a question? Yeah. About some, it looks like there's like tons and tons of stuff to do there. It's like only like a day for each like, uh, it's gonna, I guess, either do a ton of preparation or, like, why not have a little bit longer or something? I don't know. Things like when people are there, stuff get done. And you get the students, especially, who are willing to basically work for free. Unless why not make it a little longer or something. There's gotta be some way to do that, you know? We can do, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, that's that possible. Um, as far as the, what's, what's on the agenda there, it would mean that. Pretty much get, like, for example, the 3D printer and make it really efficient and well prepared. So, yeah, there's a lot of preparation and go up front. Also, at the same time, um, you know, what's what's interesting so that people people feel like one, they're both learning and then also we, we can get some meaningful work. And so, so, one week, you know, one week is easy. I think two weeks could possibly work too. Um, or something like that. And yeah, I mean, it could, could work. Could consider that. I, I have to talk to William because we're we're going to do that together. So William from London International Academy, so he's going to do some of the work on uh, the parts with Arduino elements and and possibly some of the motors that he's prototyped using through printing. So yeah, we can consider that. Is this is it going to be Johnny? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. I think, yeah, yeah. But what we really need is like a university of doing or something. Like if people actually did study universities, that would really help. Yeah, exactly. Like a, exactly. Um, I think that's, that's the kind of stuff we we'll get up and get ready for. I think um, uh, the way I'm looking at it, do a little bit this year, because I'm still I mean, I'm working on the book and getting this enterprise up off the ground. So time is precious, but I think by next year, by 2020, I'd like to see like where we do the first of all the full summer, and then extend it to after we kind of master that and get that as a regular offering, get into more of the regular, uh, regular offering where it's more and uh, more full time thing as opposed to part time thing around here. Uh, but that's yeah, that, that requires a bunch of infrastructure and things like that to happen and some staff to support that. So we're going to have it slowly, but um, if all goes well, I think the way I was thinking, I did put some pages in the wiki about summer school, that in 2020, we can be off to something that's like full blown out development, lots of people and so forth. We can possibly time that with the, the cordless drill challenge or the incentive challenge that, that we're working on in terms of that being a build out for that and for the prototyping and all kinds of different things. But yeah, it takes some resources and organizational power to, to make it happen. Okay. Um, don't join when that is going on, when you want to do that. Um, yep. Putting in the background will help make it happen. But like, also I know other people would definitely join. Yeah. But it's like, you window in your opportunity, the window of opportunity comes in your life and sometimes it closes again, you know? And then you have a job or whatever. Right. So, I hope we can do it soon. Yeah, yeah, we're yeah, working on it. So yeah, yeah, that's. Um, so I think that's. that's okay. yeah. Quick question um, yeah. about printing with uh, recyclable uh, plastic. Yeah. So I was uh, looking around on YouTube doing some research, and I saw um, at least one version where 
they uh, print directly from plastic powder as opposed to trying to go through government. Yes. Yeah. Um, are there considerations to do that? Have you thought that? Yeah, I have thought about suggestions. And uh, at that point, you're talking about a completely different design of an extruder. Now, the yeah. other challenge about that is you cannot get that as well controlled as stand filament. So you can do that, but I mean that you're gonna suffer on accuracy because you, you know, you have to put a lot of good effort into making that extruder reliable. Since first you're just melting and and it, you don't have the control as a, a well-defined three millimeter or one point seven five millimeter filament that you know is there. You know how hard you have to push it. It's gonna be much more, um, much more finicky about that. Now there are printers that do that. Like I think the. Uh, I forget what there, but, but there are there are some that do that, and there was definitely one there at the Midwest Rap Rap Festival. They had a huge printer doing that, but it could do that because I mean, its prints were not. I mean, it was spinning out like a like a one centimeter uh, filament, so huge, huge prints. It was making these huge base bases, but it wasn't well controllable. Like for example, think about retraction. If you have an extruder on top of a with a bunch of multiplast, like your extraction, your retraction, it's going to be very limited. There's only so well you can control that. So yeah, it's a much harder proposition, but definitely doable. Um, just gets us in a completely different kind of technology scheme. Yeah. Okay. Just curious. Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's all doable. It's much energy we have to to go in each direction. But as far as like. Um, there's a reason why it's not so much more popular. I mean, people have tried it. There are some projects on that yeah. but people have done small ones. But yeah, I mean, the results may be questionable at this time for how well it works. Yeah, yeah again, it worked you know, step by step. So yeah. To a picture right now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, that sounds good. Sounds good. So yeah, I think, uh, yeah, let's wrap up on this and. Let's see. Uh, thanks, Jen, for posting. You know, the agenda is a video is up on the dev team page. It's it. And like my post, and I'm going to finish recording this. It, it's like I'm basically done with putting in all the info on the video. And that thing is already halfway uploaded. So I will get us upload right after this since we have the fast internet line now. So it takes like a couple of minutes to upload it. So we'll see that right after the, the meet. Okay, so thanks everybody, and so we'll see you again on next Tuesday, April 23rd. Um, continue going. Okay, bye everybody. Thank you. Bye bye.